to the final contribution, right? Yes. Yeah. Go on. The last talk, I guess. So um, I want to thank the organizers again for um, allowing me this opportunity to come and see all these great talks and well, now to give a talk. Okay. So this is, I'm Victor DeCary. I'm a grad student at Pitt. This is joint work with Michael and Michael, who are here, and Tryon Iliescu and my advisor, Bill Layton. So this is about an artificial compression reduced order model. But here compression, this isn't compressed sensing. This is artificial compression is something in fluid dynamics that I will introduce. So we're going to consider, we want to simulate the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations. So here it is in case you haven't seen it before. Um, we're, for, the, for this talk, in the analysis anyway, we're assuming no slip boundary conditions, just to keep things as simple as possible, because issues come up with, well, in the analysis if you don't assume that. So in, in the weak formulation of this, because we're going we're gonna to be using Galerkin methods to solve this, we pick an appropriate velocity space x, which is naturally h10 and the pressure space are mean zero L2 functions. And you multiply by test functions, integrate by parts, and here's your weak formulation. So I, I guess the most important thing to take away from this slide is that now the divergence of the velocity is no longer pointwise zero, as in the incompressible case, but it's just weakly zero. It's just that the divergence of the velocity tested with these test functions q are zero. So that's kind of a subtle point that makes these uh, Galerkin methods difficult when you implement them. So what we want to do is, rather than using something like the finite element method or other Galerkin methods, we'd like to use a lower dimensional re reduced order model or ROM velocity space. And what people do is maybe they construct a pressure space, maybe they don't. We're going to construct a pressure space, but I'm going to talk about kind of these other methods that people use. Um, obviously, we want to use as few, we want to reduce the order. We want to use as few basis functions as possible. And we also want to be able to kind of seamlessly add more basis functions or take them out and basically not have like a catastrophic loss of stability in our algorithm. So the method that we use to reduce the order is just proper orthogonal decomposition, or pod, which Here's the minimization problem. It's just a constrained minimization problem. And we subject to the orthogonality condition. So the resulting basis that we get for both velocity and pressure are going to be orthogonal. Excuse me, so what yes. the, so the index little n refers oh, to a lot of snapshots? Yeah, so s so is the, the. What is exactly? Oh, yes, n is the snapshots. And so you, have, you start with uh, nothing that to start with, you have a big collection right. of snapshots that you produce yeah, by so some conventional methods. Uh, yeah, so in, in this, in the numerical testing I'll show, we produce them just with a regular finite element discretization. Okay. So the snapshots live in a finite element space. And but hopefully you will reduce the dimension. Yeah, so you know these simulations that we'll run later, the finite element spaces has like they have like So what you what do you vary to get the different snapshots? You vary the initial condition, you vary the some parameter? So in this case we just times oh, yeah. at different times. Yes, sorry, at different times. So so, so and that is a this what is this? Is it L2 node? And the UN is a matrix, essentially? The N, or sorry, UN? I mean, these, these snapshots, they are collected in the matrix. I mean, what is right. this norm? Um, so that's the L, just the L2. L2 norm over the domain, so in the PDE sense. The, so it's it's just the. Um, but, but the UN are. These are, the, these are huge convex. Right? right, so here, so in, written like this, the UN are uh, the, the finite element functions themselves. Okay, yeah. So not the vectors, okay. yeah. yeah. Oh. But later we'll, of course, extract the degrees of freedom and work with the vectors instead. It, it's all 
equivalent, I think. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So we're using so we're gonna use pod. There's other ways that you can reduce the order, but this is the simplest for now. So often so these uh, snapshots are constructed using, if they're constructed using a standard Galerkin method, then the results you get out are discretely divergence free. So that means that the, when you construct the new Galerkin formulation with the ROM basis, the pressure just drops completely out of the momentum equation. So you end up just solving for velocity and then you have to recover pressure some other way. Um, which I'll talk about different ways to do that, but you know it's kind of funny in the math literature on fluid dynamics. Often people just kind of look at pressure as like an inconvenience. It's just like a Lagrange multiplier that enforces incompressibility. But um, in the real world, we want to be able to compute stresses, so we want to recover the pressure. So one standard approach is and this is not just for pod or whatever, but this is for all CFD, is to solve the pressure Poisson equation, which is just what you get when you take the divergence of the momentum equation, you get a Poisson solve for the pressure. But um, I don't know if this has been resolved very concretely. There are people who say that they've resolved this, but there are issues with picking whether or not you should just use Neumann boundary conditions or some other cook up some other boundary conditions for the pressure. Um, you can even formulate different consistent versions of the Poisson solve. Yes? Why don't you go for mean zero solutions that gives you also a For mean zero solutions. Oh, it's, it's well posed. Yeah. It's just the, the issue, I guess, is just the physical fidelity of the boundary conditions that you pick. But so. the pressure doesn't have boundary conditions. Right, so. But, but you know it's, it has mean zero. You do know it has mean zero, so you, you, can, you can solve for it, it's well posed. But I guess there's a lot of discussion about whether or not the resulting pressure that you solve for is physically accurate or if you should have some kind of like ad hoc other pressure boundary conditions. Well, you could use as ansatz functions actually a wavelet basis, so all the, the true wavelets have mean zero. So, so using something besides very small, yeah. pod. I think it would have, get highly accurate stuff. OK. Well, that's, that's something else to try then. Okay. I, that's, that's not something that we looked at. But, um, but I guess the point is that, at least to my knowledge, it seems like there was a lot of, there's a lot of debate over how to solve for the pressure Poisson equation. And so we kind of want to sidestep this issue and keep, kind of keep the coupled formulation, coupled velocity pressure formulation. Um, so another approach is, let's say that you don't have discretely divergence free velocities, so pressure does show up in the momentum equation. So this could happen if you have maybe moving boundaries that, don't, that weren't like kind of captured in your snapshots, or maybe you are just kind of getting velocity and pressure from data. They're not going to be divergence free necessarily because real fluids aren't divergence free. So now you have to be very careful about how you pick the velocity and pressure bases. This is a very classical problem in numerical analysis. You want this very kind of restrictive in soup condition to hold. And yeah, there's a huge literature on this for Golurkin methods. Um, and it's a very, something you have to very um, firmly enforce. You don't just get it for free usually. <laughs> so there, there, are ways, there are ways that people have done this by basically adding um, extra velocity basis functions to in basically enforce LBB stability. So this is, this is kind of like the most mathematically elegant approach because you recover in soup stability, just like you have in the continuous case. But it can be very demanding depending on, like, if you have to. But again, there are known pairs that are in soup stable. Right? So, sorry. There are known, I mean, for, for the Stokes problem, there are known finite 
pairs for pressure. For finite elements, yes. Yeah, for finite elements. So, but now you are saying in the reduced. Yeah, so we're saying that when you, when you just start chopping off and do use, use a reduced basis, now you don't automatically, just because your underlying discretization might have been in soup stable, your reduced basis might not still be in soup stable. And in fact, it, it's usually not unless you actively enforce it. So this is, this is one approach that people have done where they basically, after they find a reduced basis, then they figure out exactly what they need to add to it to make it in soup stable. Um, and this act, and of course, this also adds to the degrees of freedom because you're just adding more reduced bases just to enforce stability. So, and then there's, in general, for Galerkin methods, you can add more stabilizations to make what would otherwise be not in soup stable methods stable. And see, so these are all other things that you could maybe apply to a pod setting, but we're going to talk about artificial compression methods. So this is a very interesting, so artificial compression methods is the approach of adding this epsilon PT term so to perturb the continuity equation. And this goes back to like the 60s and 70s, originally by Chorin and Taimam. Um, and then this has been analyzed a lot and extended by others later. But this is a regularization to the equations that gets rid of the saddle point problem. So I don't care about in soup stability as much anymore. And also, when you compute this, the resulting snapshots aren't going to be discretely divergence free anymore because they're perturbed a little bit. So now they can show up in the momentum in, in the ROM setting, and I can just solve a coupled system again without doing a pressure Poisson solve every time. And I have no issues with the boundary conditions. So th here it is in the fully discrete setting, which is really just what I showed. So this is kind of like the Navier-Stokes setting. Instead of H's for the finite element width, I have R's for the pod bases. Um, and I can use R velocity bases and M pressure bases. And now I've stuck this epsilon here. So this is just a backward Euler discretization of this model. And so what we did in our, so for this paper, for our tests, we constructed in the offline stage the snapshots with this method as well. And then in the online stage, we use the same artificial compression method. And you can also, with artificial compression methods, you can also very easily decouple velocity and pressure solve, so you can solve for them in two blocks. OK, um, so what happens if you either don't set, if you don't satisfy in soup stability and you don't try to correct it with some stabilization? When you do the error analysis, you pick up a bad term that's delta t to the negative 1. So you expect to see eventually order reduction in your method. Um, so this is pessimistic, though, because it's multiplied by constants. And we're going to later kind of quantify what these constants are. Um, just so to make this point, so we, in the error analysis, we typically decompose things into um, the interpolation error. So this is the, basically the best approximation of the pod basis, how, how well it approximates the true velocity. And then the best approximation minus the pod basis, or the pod function that we actually compute. And the problem term, this delta t to the minus 1 is multiplied by this term, so the divergence of the interpolation error um, dotted with the basically the pressure error. So the standard thing to do in analysis is just to do Cauchy-Schwartz, but this is a very bad, pessimistic way to do it. But if these things lie in two different spaces, then we know from like calculus or whatever that you can kind of, you have this angle representation. So alpha is the cosine of some angle between two spaces. So as long as these things have um, non-trivial intersection, you can hopefully calculate alpha. And this alpha will give you a better, less pessimistic bound, and hopefully control that bad power of delta t. And so this is just a 
calculation now. This is just another slide about how this is calculated. And once we've calculated the reduced bases, so let's say I have like 10 velocity snap or 10 velocity bases and five pressure bases, then this calculation is like pretty trivial to do now in the once I have a handle on what they are. Um, let's see. That's just more about how to do the calculation. So that so this is the error result, and this really highlights this problem. So this this alpha is that number coming out of the angle condition between the divergence of the velocities and the pressures. And hopefully this alpha squared over delta minus 1 kind of balance each other out. And you're also helped out by just the grad of the interpolation error. So this is the error result. If alpha is small and if the interpolation error is good, we expect to see first order convergence. Um, so this is, this is very related to the inf soup constant, by the way. Um, you have this kind of nice relation between alpha and beta. So it's like we, we trade inf soup. Instead of a grad down here, we can put a div in the bottom because div is smaller than the gradient. And then we have a soup soup constant. So that's kind of funny. And um, so we actually want alpha to be small, which means that the inf soup constant, which you normally in the classical saddle point problem, you want that to be close to 1. But we want alpha to be small, which means our inf soup constant has to be small. So that's kind of in. But, but we don't care. This doesn't really affect us that much. It's just kind of an interesting um, comparison. Let's see how I do. OK, so I'll just get to the numerical tests. We did this on this. Uh, we wanted to get kind of an interesting problem around an obstacle, but with Dirichlet data, so homogeneous Dirichlet data. So what this is is basically a cylinder with a cylindrical cutout, and we just have a rotational body force. So we get a von Karman vortex street, but going around in a circle, basically. So I did these all in Phoenix. So the underlying discretization was about 100,000 velocity degrees of freedom. Um, with this viscosity and flow configuration, the Reynolds numbers, it's still a low Reynolds number flow, but it's about 100, 200. And I took snapshots every 2.5, 10 to the negative 4 seconds. Basically, I ramped up this flow from zero until it kind of developed and became quasi-periodic, and then I started taking snapshots for a while. And so here's the rate of decay of the singular values basically shows that we can capture the bulk of the flow energy with just kind of the first five or so singular values. Uh, yes? I mean, that assumes that your snapshots capture. Right. Everything. So then you are saying you are capturing what the snapshots capture. Exactly. So if you, if you, if you miss with your snapshots, snapshots a substantial part you will never see. Right? right. So I guess in like a true error analysis, there'd be like another triangle inequality where it would be two. Well, the only here. thing is, how do you get that other part? Right. But, but we we computed the other. We computed the other part with a oh, method that. So the high fidelity. Provable, that provably converges to the true solution. So you, you you validated it by high fidelity method. Right. So let's. So here's a, just so you can kind of visually see the what these pod modes look like. This, these are just the magnitudes of the velocities. So it starts out with because I didn't subtract out by the average, but you get kind of the first pod mode is basically the bulk flow, and then higher order fluctuations as you go down. So kind of like you would expect to see. Um, now I have a video where. We just sort of compare the higher fidelity, fidelity simulation with just using a few different pod modes. I'm not sure where the video went. Oh, cool. It's just been playing. <laughs> so in the top left is using three pod functions. And this is equal velocity and pressure functions, which you normally would not want to do. But we can do it because we don't aren't bothered by the inf soup constant. And you can see that you only really need once you get to five, you basically capture 
in the eyeball norm, the offline part. So that worked very well. Um, let me go back to my presentation. I'm okay, and I promise I'm almost done with the numerical tests. So like I said, the motivation was we wanted to robustly capture pressure again so we could calculate forces. And that's why we put the cutout there so we could calculate the lift and drag around that cutout. And you can see that, so the blue curve is using just three basis functions, but then as you add more, you capture the, the reference values. And here's the relationship between that alpha and the nth sup constant, because we could calculate these things very easily. So this is the nth sup constant over here, and it's, this is 10 to the negative 9. So it's basically 0, so it's garbage. And what, what, what you want is that in the normal saddle point formulation is for beta to be close to 1. But then on the other hand, we replaced it with this alpha condition. So alpha squared, as you keep adding more and more bases, it, like it starts out very small. And then it kind of approaches 1 over 100, um, which is pretty good. It's a, it's a lot better than just having a generic constant there. And there might be ways in the way that you generate your basis functions that you can cleverly shrink this alpha in the offline stage, which we haven't tried yet, but that would be the next thing to try. And then th this is convergence to the data, but we just kind of, since we had this um, full error analysis result, we kind of wanted to just do a consistency check for velocity and pressure. And that's with 50 basis functions each. Okay, so this is a nice way to decouple velocity and pressure. It doesn't have to fulfill the in soup condition, so you can just kind of add however many velocity or pressure basis functions you want into your ROM. And yes, kind of the same thing. We don't, we don't require discreetly divergence-free snapshots, so this might be a good way to kind of integrate dirty velocity data into a, a ROM. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions, comments? So that, that's an interesting idea with this perturbation in, in the continuity equation. Uh, mm -hmm. So but intuitively, I would say, well, if this, you, you really don't want to have a large epsilon there. So right. you want to have a small epsilon there. But if you want to have a small epsilon there, you are close to your original equation. So. Uh, why doesn't then the in soup condition bother? It's a good question. Um, you don't seem to see it, right? Right. We don't. We don't see a breakdown because in yeah. in the normal case, in the normal literature, you expect like when you don't have in soup, you expect to see like I guess checkerboard patterns on a finite element mesh, and I don't know what that would look like here, but. We don't really see any kind of wild pressure uh, oscillations. One, maybe one, one explanation could be the infinite dimensional problem is in soup state. At least for moderate Reynolds numbers, right? Because the Stokes problem is in soup state. So if right. you don't if you do not perturb the Stokes problem too much, then you you have an infinite dimensional in soup stability. You, maybe your, what you do with, uh, with your computing your reduced basis is you, you stay close to this. And I mean closer to this than this but when, discrete problem, which is in some sense artificial. So. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just not sure because when we compute the, the in suit constant, it's zero. So it seems like we're not uh -huh. anywhere close to fulfilling in suit stability. But this this is done with. Um, this is known also in the regular finite element case that P1, P1 elements are in soup stable, and but you can add kind of regularizations to the equations and still get convergence. And yeah, but you must pay at some point, either through smearing or. Okay, so I, I think the if, if, if you if you crank down the the regularization, it must kick in. Then. 
Right. Well, I think this is one place we pay for it, is with this, because we can't avoid this term. I see. And, um, and I, I mean, the gradient of this interpolation error, what is it? Is that may, um, couldn't that be big too? And that might be big too, depending on the data. Um, also, when you solve these things, it's, it doesn't affect us as much here, but if you, make, if you want to make epsilon really small, that can lead to ill conditioning. So I don't think, so that'll make iterative solvers break down and it'll make your simulations bad. Okay. Because these systems are so small, we're not using iterative solvers or anything. Yeah, you use direct. But if it's very ill conditioned, you also pay in a direct solver. <laughs> yes, yes, you will right. eventually pay the price. Nice. Okay, so but you, this really uh, benefits from the fact that your actual systems are very small. In, in this regime, you are able to get away with a very small dimensional reduced space. Right. That's the, that's the thing. Okay. That's, okay. If there are no more comments, well, then let's.